Hello, my name is Professor Eric McDaniel. I am a member of the Department of Government at the University of Texas at Austin. In today's lecture, what I will discuss is the relationship between political institutions, focusing on how the judiciary interacts with the legislative and executive branches. From this lecture, I would like you to learn three key things. First, the courts are part of the policy making process. So while as we think of the courts as purely a legal institution, they are also part of the politics that go into making policy. Second, the court's ability to influence the policy making process is through the power of judicial review. Finally, we may think of the courts as being highly independent but their actions can be constrained by Congress and the president. So let's start with the courts as part of the policy process. Many of us interpret the courts as being a purely legal institution. However, because the courts play such a key role in establishing what is and what is not allowed, they are a critical part of the policy making process. Even if the court should be understood as just a referee, anyone who has watched sports knows that a referee can drastically impact the outcome of a game. Just as an umpire determines what is in or out of the strike zone, or a referee determines what is or what is not a penalty in football, the courts do the same by deciding what is and what is not allowed. And just like a call by a referee or an umpire can drastically change the outcome of a game, the decision of the Supreme Court can drastically change policies. Here are a few recent examples of how the courts have influenced policy. Healthcare reform. So in the suit against the Affordable Care Act, the court ruled that it supported the individual mandate, but struck down forcing states to expand Medicaid and enforcing employers to provide contraceptive coverage. Same-sex marriage, the courts settled a debate within and across states regarding what relationships would be legally recognized. Campaign financing. In establishing that money was a form of speech, the courts drastically changed the nature of fundraising for elections. And finally, immigration. The court ruled that if the Trump administration was going to rescind the protections uh, from DACA, it would need stronger justification. In all of these instances, the courts played a role in shaping policy and the direction the policy would take. So it is critical that we understand the courts as not just being a legal institution, but also being part of the policy process. The courts can influence policy decisions because of their per the perceived legitimacy of their decisions. So in fact, many judges uh, may portray themselves as being outside the political fights over policy. The reason for this is that the courts gain their power through the public's perception of its legitimacy. As Justice Elena Kagan stated recently, all of us need to realize how precious the court's legitimacy is. It's an incredibly important thing for the court to guard its reputation of being impartial, being neutral, and not simply being an extension of a polarizing process. Now, while, and the reason why Congress for, focuses on its legitimacy is that the courts do not have the power to enforce their decisions. While Congress has the power of the purse and the president has the power of the sword, the court's power comes from people's belief in the legitimacy of its decisions. The courts, saying that they have the power of the purse means they can give money and take money away. The power of the sword and the power of the president is the power can use the military, can use, can force individuals to do things, such as sending in federal troops to desegregate schools in Arkansas. These are the powers that Congress and the president have. The courts do not have these powers. And so because of this, they are reliant upon their legitimacy because they do not have the same powers that the Congress and the president has to enforce their decisions. Now, the way in which the courts are able to influence the policy process is through judicial review. And judicial review is the power of the courts to declare null and void laws of Congress and of state legislatures they find unconstitutional. Now, 
one of the things that's important to understand about judicial review is that it was not explicitly stated in the Constitution. Judicial review is something that is somewhat implied and has been a tradition that has, been, that has taken on over time. So it's important to understand how judicial review was established. It's important to note that because the Constitution does not explicitly provide the courts uh, for the power for judicial review, but in exercising it, the courts have been able to distinguish themselves from, the, from Congress and the president. And the case that is again, critical for understanding the establishing of judicial review is Marbury v. Madison. Now, let's start with the facts of the case. There was a conflict over judicial appointments, and this conflict was really part of the political rivalry between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. The Adams defeated Jefferson in an earlier election, Jefferson won in the next election, and while Jefferson had won. There's a bit of time before there's a change in power before Jefferson's, Jefferson's inauguration. During this time period, John Adams and his uh, members of his party appointed 42 new justices of the peace for Washington, D.C. So it was approved by the Senate. They were signed. And all that was left is for the letters to be sent out and for them to receive their official commission in order to, to take the job. However, the Adams administration did not have enough time to issue all of these, <clears throat> all of these letters, all of these commissions. And when Jefferson came into office, he refused the delivery of all of these commissions. So there was a complaint about this because Marbury wanted to receive his, his commission. So he sued using the Judiciary Act of, 1870, of 1789 as a justification, which allowed for appointee to request a court order to force the granting of appointments. Now, what's important about this is that the Judiciary Act of 1789 gave the Supreme Court original jurisdiction. And this is a critical thing to be aware of when understanding the court's decision. That again, it said that the uh, that people who are given these appointments can request a court order to make sure it is filled and the original jurisdiction where it originally be uh, uh, heard is the Supreme Court. So not in the lower federal courts will not decide on, but the Supreme Court will decide on this. Now, it's important to understand that there were a few things to be aware of regarding the courts that were surrounding this case. One, this was a political fight. This was a fight between the factions of Adams and the factions of Jefferson. And that the court was engaged in the midst of a political fight of resolving this political fight. Now, Thomas Jefferson and his supporters were highly antagonistic towards the courts because many of the members of the Supreme Court were appointed by Adams. So they saw them some basically as Adams cronies. Uh, one Jefferson supporter went as far as stating the that it's a hospital of decayed politicians. And so because of this, the court was in a very weird situation. And a ruling in favor of Marbury would be ignored by the Jefferson administration, making the court look weak. A ruling in favor of Madison would confirm that the court was basically subordinate to the president. And so what the court needed to do was establish itself independent of the president and of Congress. And so this was a very unique situation for the court. And again, the Marbury v. Madison decision is important, not just because it established judicial review, but it also allowed the court to establish itself. Now, the decision that was handed down, uh, again, written by Chief Justice John Marshall, argued that Marbury did have his right to receive his commission, and he did have the right to sue. However, the court struck down the portion of the Judiciary Act of 1789 that gave the Supreme Court original jurisdiction. They argued that this portion of the law was unconstitutional. And the reason why it was unconstitutional is because only the Constitution can establish original jurisdiction for the Supreme Court. Therefore, the Supreme Court could not issue an order to the Jefferson administration to deliver the appointment. So 
the Supreme Court's ruling was that yes, Marbury was uh, justified in the suit. There is a problem. Marbury should be seated. However, the law stating that we should make the decision on this, on whether or not he should receive his appointment is unconstitutional. And because of this, we cannot issue this order. And this is, this is very critical. They said Marbury was correct and Marbury should, this should be issued to Marbury. But they said that the law giving them the power to make this decision was unconstitutional. Therefore, they cannot issue it. And so in many ways, in some ways, they kind of sidestep the court case or, or sidestep the issue at hand. But it's important to pay attention to the ramifications of this decision. So one, it established the ability of the court to strike down a law as violating the Constitution. And as Chief Justice John Marshall wrote in his opinion, it is emphatically the province and duty of the Judicial Department to say what the law is. Furthermore, it allowed the court to sidestep a political controversy and establish itself as an independent institution. And again, this is critical because the court is concerned about its own institutional legitimacy being seen as something independent of the Congress and of the president. It's not a puppet of Congress, nor, neither is it a, uh, a puppet of the president. And so the court is very concerned about this. And while the, we think of the court as being highly independent, they have lifetime appointments, one of the things we realize is that they are not as independent as we think. And just as the courts and the president can influence the actions of Congress, and Congress and the courts can influence the actions of the president, Congress and the president can influence the actions of the court. And so it's important to be aware of the various types of influences that can come about on the Supreme Court. Now, there are two types of influences that I'm going to focus on, and these deal primarily with congressional action. The first is rash, rational anticipation. And the second one is institutional maintenance. So let's start off with rational anticipation. Rational anticipation is the court concern that Congress may attempt to circumvent their decision, creating a worse policy outcome. So in this case, the court may strike down law A, so Congress decides to pass law B, which is worse, which is the worst law in the court's eyes. And so the rational anticipation argument is that the court would not strike down a law because they believe that Congress will attempt to circumvent this, creating an even worse law. Institutional maintenance is a little bit different. Institutional maintenance deals with the fear of presidential or congressional retribution for striking down a law. And so this may lead to the courts being less likely to strike down a law that has recently been passed. And there are various ways in which there have been attacks on the court's institutional maintenance. And in fact, Thomas Jefferson, because he was upset about judicial review, tried to use many of these tactics as a way to undermine the court. And these tactics have been used repeatedly and are still being used as a way to try to influence the court's decisions. So one, using Senate confirmation process to select certain types of judges. So when you watch the Senate confirmation hearings, and there will be one upcoming with the death of Associate Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that there will be a new Senate confirmation. Pay attention to these hearings, because in these hearings, the senators will be asking specific questions saying these are the types of judges that I want seated and being and opposed to other types of judges. Second, enacting constitutional amendments regarding decisions. So the 16th Amendment, was, which provides the ability for the federal government to give an income tax, is in response to a court ruling in, in 1895, which struck down a federal income tax. So one way to get around the Supreme Court is by creating a new, uh, a new amendment to the Constitution. Impeachment. There's only been one Supreme Court justice who was impeached, and this was Justice Samuel Chase. He was impeached by the House of Representatives in 1805 for his open criticism of the actions that, Je that Jefferson and his administration were taking towards the court. He was impeached by the House of Representatives uh, however, he was not convicted by the Senate, and he would go on to serve in the Supreme Court until he passed away. 
Another tactic is withdrawing jurisdiction over certain subjects. Article three of the constitution authorizes Congress to determine whether the types of classes of cases and controversies that the lower courts will have access to. And so many times Congress will, in the law that they're writing, will dictate who can hear the court, the cases if there's a fight over this law. And it will lead to certain federal courts as opposed to others as a way to kind of get the, get the outcome they want from the courts. Also, they're slashing the budget, so not providing raises, not allowing um, an expansion of AIDS, and this is a key thing that's, that's critical. While the, the, while the salaries of the judges cannot be reduced, they can just not be raised. And you could also not raise the salaries of the AIDS as a way of institutional maintenance. Also, altering the size of the court. And so Jefferson thought about this, and uh, most recently, we saw in the early 20th century with the New Deal, FDR. So President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, upset about the court striking down a variety of New Deal policies, actually floated the idea of adding number of judges, more judges to the court. There is nothing that states the Supreme Court should have nine judges. It is just tradition that we are used to nine judges on the Supreme Court. And Roosevelt felt like, well, maybe we should have 15. You all are looking a little bit older, you're moving a bit slow. Maybe I should add six more justices uh, so to, to kind of help you out to increase efficiency. He didn't do this, but this was clearly seen as a threat to the legitimacy of the court. And in fact, there have been concerns that with the, uh, with the Trump administration and the Republicans in the Senate trying to push forward a, uh, a Supreme Court nomination so close to the election in 2020, when they, were unable, when they were unwilling to do it in 2016, there was a concern that they are trying to, I guess, have some level of court packing. And that the response is that if the Democrats get control of the Senate, uh, that they may add control of the presidency and the Senate, they may add more justices as a way to balance this. And this, again, is a threat to the legitimacy of the court. By adding more justices, by expanding it from nine to maybe 13 or 15, what you are doing is saying, we don't trust you, so we're going to add some people here who we think will do a much better job. And this is a threat to the institutional maintenance of the court. And it's very important to pay attention to this as we look at how people will react to the filling of the, the, the empty seat left by the death, left because of the death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So what do we know about these two? Do, does rational anticipation matter? Does institutional maintenance matter? What do we find? Well, in the work of Siegel, Westerland, and Lindquist, they find that rational anticipation has little to do with the court's decisions. The court is not necessarily concerned about Congress going out and making, trying to circumvent the law and making an even worse law. In, many, in their eyes, they think, well, you know what, we'll just strike that law down. How, but institutional maintenance does matter. When the court feels Congress or the president will attempt to act against the court, the court is less likely to strike down a law. So when the court believes there's a threat to its institutional legitimacy, to its institutional maintenance, it is less likely to strike down a law. So the courts are responsive to the president and Congress. If they believe that the stance that they take is going to be going to receive a great deal of anger and retribution from Congress and the president, or Congress or the president, they are less likely to strike down a law. So to summarize this argument, the first thing again to remember is the court should be understood as part of the larger policy making process. They are partners along with Congress and the president. Second, the court influences policy through judicial review and the perceived legitimacy of its decisions. And again, it's this perceived legitimacy of its decisions that gets people to follow along. This is why states where there was a very strong opposition to same-sex marriage still issue these licenses after the court ruled in favor of same-sex marriage because the court's decision was seen as legitimate. Finally, much like the courts can 
constrain the activities of Congress and the president, the courts are also constrained. So we must understand that while the justices do have a level of independence, they are still responsive to the interest and again, perce perceptions of Congress and the president. Thank you.